Number two, Rampage World Tour. That kind of works as a title, almost giant monsters. A terrifying titan, an unstoppable Goliath that has risen from impossible depths to wreak utter havoc on an unsuspecting public, whose devastation has bred fanship, loyalty, even worship. Yes, of course I'm talking about the MCU, the decade-long franchise that's completely recalibrated the standard for summer blockbusters. But the overlapping characters, connected universe, and rapidly expanding mythos have also redefined expectations of movie franchises as a whole. But this didn't happen overnight. The gears were turning long before Endgame, long before superhero movies were standard fare, before Spider-Man, before X-Men, before Batman, before The Shadow. Boy, well, that was a weird one, huh? Even before 1978 Superman. It was all about monsters. And while the USA has no shortage of creature features, from Frankenstein to the creature of the Black Lagoon to the giant claw, boy, that was another weird one, there's one monster that still reigns supreme as king. Godzilla. And while King of the Monsters didn't exactly set the box office on fire, or blast it with atomic breath as it were, it's still an incredibly, astoundingly relevant franchise. So what does giant ass Godzilla have to do with the MCU, other than being kind of like that one time that Ant-Man got all big? Well, stick with me. I'm gonna show you how the 60 plus year old Godzilla franchise set the template for the MCU. Number five, the biggest crossover event of the 20th century. Godzilla is quite obviously big enough to sustain his own movie, which was called a, well, a Godzilla. But while the original 1954 classic was an old fashioned parable of mankind versus the unstoppable destructor awoken from scientific folly in an era of post-nuclear terror, the series is maybe best remembered for giant monsters punching the living shit out of each other. It almost goes without saying, but I feel like I must acknowledge the obvious. The Godzilla franchise was a trailblazer for including a rotating cast of high concept characters who were sometimes featured together, sometimes alone, but generally understood to occupy the same universe. Sure, Abbott and Costello met Frankenstein in 1948 and The Invisible Man in 1951, but the Godzilla franchise was one that hinged on an internal consistency of its mythology. It wasn't played off for gags. The best known kaiju, second only to Godzilla, is Mothra. Starting off in her own movie, Mothra quickly became incredibly popular and was soon pitted against Godzilla in, well, Mothra versus Godzilla. In some ways, it's not entirely unlike Iron Man and Cap, but you know, in Godzilla's universe, and they're both introduced independently and eventually pitted against each other, but you know, with like even more quietly erotic energy. Of course, Mothra is just one of many characters who's become a regular face in the series, or in Ghidorah's case, uh, three faces. Every theatrical release was an opportunity to see your favorite characters mixed and matched. And not unlike the MCU tie-in TV shows, Godzilla, Gigan, and Ghidorah all appeared in Toho's Zone Fighter. Across the entire franchise, your favorite characters are sometimes fighting each other, sometimes fighting together. It's the seminal franchise for unlikely team-ups. Toho even had their own Avengers-type film in the form of 1968's Destroy All Monsters, where they smashed all of their characters together in one giant world-stomping epic. And easily, easily the best movie title of all time. Just saying it makes me happy. Destroy All Monsters, no. I love monsters, I'll never destroy them. You can't make me. Number four, the Kevin Feige of Kaiju. Well, that is a hell of a sentence that I really had a lot of fun saying. The MCU is by no means an auteur effort, with its many directors bringing their own unique visions and voices to the series, from Taika Waititi's bombastic colorful fun of Thor 3 to Kenneth Branagh's Shakespearean pomposity of Thor 1, which I still love, and it is perfect, except for, you know, the one Hawkeye part that was obviously like shot months later. But what is amazing is that from Iron Man all the way through Endgame, there is a general consistency of vision in how all the pieces fit. And we have to chalk that all up to Kevin Feige, who holds 30 credits for MCU films, both completed and upcoming, six MCU shows, and like a dozen plus credits on other superhero franchises. Depending on how you count the numbers or his level of involvement, you could consider Kevin Feige the single most successful storyteller in cinema's history. But the Godzilla Cinematic Universe, featuring that vast array of aforementioned characters, had something of their own Kevin Feige, and that just so happened to be the director of the very first Godzilla film, Ishiro Honda. In the original run of Godzilla films from 1954 to 1975, called the Showa period, more on this later, seven of the 15 mainline Godzilla films were directed by Honda. 
And if seven films doesn't impress you enough, just keep in mind that's only entries featuring Godzilla. He also blew out the Godzilla-verse with other films that introduce key players like Rodan, Mothra, and is also responsible for King Kong Escapes in 1967 and Frankenstein Conquers the World in 1965, which is extremely real. Its realness is sometimes just baffling to me. In a lot of ways, Honda is kind of like if you rolled Kevin Feige and Stan Lee into one person. He's not just responsible for making the movies, he's basically the father of the genre as a whole, which assumes more of Stan Lee than he's technically even responsible for. Honda either directly created or had hand in the creation of Godzilla, Ghidorah, Mothra, Rodan, Manda, Gorosaurus, Baragon, Varon, and Udako. He, however, is not responsible for Manila, and someone really should take responsibility for Manila and then, you know, go to prison forever, basically. And of course, we must give mention to Tomoyuki Tanaka, Toho's film producer who produced every single Godzilla and sci-fi monster movie from 1954 to 1995. Tanaka was responsible for working in the atomic bomb messaging into the original Godzilla and helped bring the films to wider audiences with international casting. He passed away in 1997, so 1998's Godzilla was dedicated to him, which, well, I don't know how I would feel about that personally. I certainly don't know how he feels about it. Number three, making effects feel special. I'm not exactly sure that it's fair to say that Marvel movies have pushed the boundaries of special effects. I mean, Endgame looks pretty darn good, but it didn't necessarily bring anything new to the table like Terminator 2 or The Matrix or, you know, like it or not, Avatar. But the MCU did something that was maybe more significant. It raised the regular standard for what special effects should be in blockbusters. Their quality and consistency made it hard to compete if your movie looked, um, well, you know, like this. The Godzilla franchise did this and more, really. While King Kong might have utilized some pretty impressive stop motion effects for the 1930s, it was pretty dated by the 1950s. So-called giant monsters were cool to look at, but maybe not believable. Enter special effects god Iji Tsuburaya, who didn't just create Ultraman, but basically invented the tokusatsu, dudes in monster suits, genre. Originally, Tomoyuki Tanaka intended to use stop motion effects in order to bring Godzilla to life, but because of budgets, it just wasn't in the cards. It's one of those things that seems so obvious when you think about it, but the solution of making the monster normal size and the city small is kind of revolutionary in a world where people were otherwise still using corny trick photography to make actual tiny animals appear large. The Godzilla suits and miniature effects looked great in the original, and admittedly, sometimes not quite as great. Godzilla was primarily portrayed by three different actors across the mainline series. Haru Nakajima from the original 1954 Godzilla to Godzilla vs. Gigan in 1972, Kenpachiro Satsuma from The Return of Godzilla in 1984 through Godzilla vs. Destroya in 1995, and Tsutomu Kitagawa from Godzilla 2000 to Godzilla Final Wars in 2004. Much like the MCU, they established consistency in effects performance. Maybe a little too consistent, in fact. They frequently reuse the same suits from film to film because they were so expensive to produce. Occasionally, you can even spot some wear and tear in the lower budget movies. But not unlike Iron Man getting new suits from film to film, Godzilla was upgraded as well. From things as minor as changes in eye size to things as major as burning Godzilla, who has radiation shining over his entire body. But, you know, even when Godzilla was at his goofiest, this was a revolution in the consistency of effects in monster movies that, like the MCU, set a new standard for what audience expected. Whether it was the three-headed, no-armed Ghidorah, the giant squid Ebira, the smoke monster Hidora, the snake monster Manda, or whatever the hell Gigan is, the tokusatsu genre of effects not only set the stage for things like Kamen Rider, Power Rangers, Beetleborgs, but also carved a path for the new wave of superhero movies that would emerge in the early 2000s. Number two, going global. Have you ever wondered why so many American action movies so frequently go to China? The answer is, well, pretty simple. It's a huge market, and with movies as expensive as they are these days, production companies quite literally cannot afford to not appeal to international markets. This is why Dwayne Johnson's Skyscraper set in Hong Kong, or why 2012's Looper had a middle section set in Shanghai, which was actually lengthened for international release. But it's also something that the MCU has been gaming regularly. Do you recall how in Iron Man 3, they featured a doctor from China who just kind of emerges out of nowhere? Well, that's because the movie was co-financed by China. This is the same reason that Doctor Strange's climax takes place in Hong Kong. And this isn't a new practice. However, it's worked in the other direction as well. In fact, the original Godzilla went incredibly out of their way to prep a version of the movie that would be palatable for Western audiences in the 1950s, with a debatable level of quality. And not really so debatable because it's bad. It's not good. 
Godzilla, king of the monsters, whose death ray blasts the city from the face of the earth before your very eyes. The American version of Godzilla added Steve Martin. Now, not that Steve Martin, I'm talking about the reporter character that they wrote, filmed, and inserted specifically for English-speaking audiences. And yeah, while it's kind of weird and it kind of sucks, it's super interesting in execution. And while minute to minute, maybe this cut is not incredibly respectful to the Japanese, it keeps the story in Tokyo and actually employed Asian actors to fill the scenes, something that modern American movies still struggle with. This movie was a huge success on American shores, raking in approximately two million 1956 dollars by contrast, it only pulled in a little over 500,000 bucks in Japan. So, Steve Martin, maybe pretty good. No, not that Steve Martin, I'm talking about the other one again. God. And number one, really just too many other similarities to fairly count. We've got a lot of the big ones out of the way, but where to start with the other similarities? I mean, ripoffs would be a good one, much in the way that the MCU made everyone hungry for a slice of the connected universe pie from DC all the way to Universal's ill-fated dark universe monster reboot, Godzilla was immediately met with a fair share of genre imitators as well. Gamera is the most notable of these, definitely the DC to Godzilla's Marvel. Premiering in 1965, Gamera basically just slapped a shell on Godzilla and turned him into a turtle. He even has the same backstory of being awoken from an ancient slumber to punish mankind for their atomic folly. Gamera, also like DC, has a legacy of being relentlessly dunked on, thanks in large part to localization producer Sandy Frank making several shoddy dubs and re-edits that became main staples of Mystery Science Theater 3000. The dunking was in fact so severe that Frank actually tried to track down the episodes and keep them from being circulated. And thank God that this guy didn't have to hack it in the YouTube era because I've seen your mean comments. They're really mean. It's fine though, because it's the internet. I mean, it's not fine, don't do that. Another great similarity is that Godzilla basically had its own endgame, and it was pretty recent too. One of the highest rostered, all of your favorite characters under one roof movie, Godzilla Final Wars dug through every nook and cranny of the Godzilla universe to bring out every character, famous and obscure, to smash them together. Most infamously, it even dragged out Zilla, the featured creature from the 1998 Matthew Broderick Godzilla movie, and slapped the crap out of him in a hilariously anticlimactic fight. It probably goes without saying, but Toho isn't exactly irreverent of the maligned American movie. Final Wars also really was a series capper. It ended the Toho series for another 12 years until 2016's Shin Godzilla, which was only produced, of course, to show up another middling American Godzilla movie. Which brings me to my final point reboots. And this is exciting because this is something that we're about to see a lot of with the MCU. With both Iron Man and Cap hanging it up and moving on, who's to say exactly what's next for the franchise? While Endgame had a series finale energy, they're certainly not turning off the money machine just because they lost a couple of actors. Godzilla has had four different eras. The Showa, Heisei, Millennium, and Reiwa period, each with their own individual continuities. Sometimes Mecha Godzilla is all robot, and sometimes it's built around the bones of the original Godzilla. Sometimes the original Godzilla is dead and we're seeing a new Godzilla. Sometimes it's a remake, so we're seeing the beast for the first time. So looking forward to the next period of Marvel movies, just know that it can always get weirder and that we might see Mecha Captain America built around the bones of the original Steve Rogers. Probably not that. Probably not that. As a final thought, maybe the most important thing that Godzilla did was legitimize a genre that was previously considered to be trash. B monster movies were derided as kitty garbage, a frivolous waste of time and mental real estate. But Godzilla came along not just with cool effects and thrilling visuals, it was a movie that had an agenda, and this is what made it memorable. With Japan just having been bombed only nine years earlier, Godzilla is a film about living with the trauma and fear of the nuclear age. And while the MCU maybe hasn't grappled with the topic so challenging, Godzilla opened the door to genre pictures to tackle problems with sincerity and humanity. Sure, to many people Godzilla is just a guy in a rubber suit, but to others, Godzilla is an icon that showed audiences that a monster movie could be thrilling and terrifying, but also political and thought-provoking, and more than anything, incredibly human.
Hey everybody, if you enjoyed that video, by far the best way to support Dorkly is to sign up for Dropout for less than the price of an indie game that you buy and then only ever play once. Every month you get Dorkly videos a week early, you get access to the exclusive Discord where you can talk with us, you get exclusive shows like D20 and Troopers, which are both so funny. So go to dropout.tv, sign up for the free trial. You will not regret it. Like you regret that one indie game that you can't even remember the name of. At the behest of the sorcerer?